Welcome. So we'll get started. Thank you everyone for coming for Breakfast at Sky. So to start this morning, we would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 1 territory and that this land is the traditional territory of Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And today we have um, presenters about SIP shops for our Breakfast at Sky and the SIP shops presentations and workshops are funded by the Child Rights Spore Network and the Children's Hospital Research Institute of Manitoba. So we're really happy to have um, presenters here to talk about how we can involve siblings in care and the importance of involving siblings. Um, so we have two presenters. Julie Walsh is a registered social worker and family therapist who has been facilitating SIB shops and presenting about siblings experiences since 2011. And Grace and I <laughs> um, is a post baccalaureate student at the University of Manitoba and she has two younger brothers who are autistic and has been a peer mentor and facilitator with the SIB shops program since 2012. So we're very pleased to have them here today and for the people who are joining us on the webinar which is quite a few people from really thrilled and really well attended presentation. Um, if you have any questions or comments for the presenters just type them into the chat box and then I'll read them out at the end and they can answer your questions. Take it away Julie. Hello. Can you hear me? That's good. Good morning. So my name is Julie Walsh. I'm going to be doing the bulk of the talking because I do most of the presenting and I'm lucky enough to have Grace here. She's volunteered with my with the SIP shop program, not my program for six years now and she's volunteered to share some of her experiences at the end. Um, I do not have a sibling with special needs or any um, differences. Though, as you'll see, I have a family member with that. So just a little brief clip about me and um, and about Grace, and then we'll get into the presentation. So as Jesse was saying, I have my master's in social work. I work as a child and family therapist. Um, my specialty now is attachment, developmental trauma, reunification, family therapy, and play. But I got involved in this program because during my master's, my focus was on disability-related issues within the family and how we support family members. Um, I currently run a private practice, but I spent 12 years at a couple of nonprofit agencies, including St. Amant. I worked there for six years. Um, I do not have, as I said, a sibling with any special needs, but I am. My mother has an acquired brain injury. And so I grew up having a parent with differences and looking at kind of how that plays out in family centered care. Hi. Can you hear me? I know I'm really short. There we go. Thank you. So hi, I'm Grace. Um, as Jesse said, I am a post bac student at the University of Manitoba, and I'm hoping to get my counseling certificate soon. Um, I also do counseling at the Women's Health Clinic as part of the Birth Control and Pregnancy Program. I've been there for the past three years, um, and I have been doing SIP jobs with Julie since 2012. And I have two younger brothers with autism and seizure disorders, which is kind of how I got involved in SIP shops and wanting to help reach out to other people who are in similar situations and maybe wanted someone to talk with and kind of get different ideas and perspectives about how to kind of go from there and see what other people are experiencing and what we can each kind of learn from each other. Here you go. Thank you. I think I'll just hold this now. So this morning, we got quite a bit to do. Um, I This is part of a larger presentation that I do. So I, and Grace has helped out with a couple of times. I tend to do a, it's been up to a full day, but typically it's a four hour presentation with three hours of information. Um, so we're taking kind of one of those sections and then there's usually three hours of information and then we host what's called a SIB panel afterwards for an hour and have a couple of siblings talk about their experiences. Um, so this morning what we're going to talk about is why we need to support siblings, the big three, which are issues affecting siblings. They're the three most common issues affecting siblings in the research, in their own discussions, in, in literature, um, common, common sibling reactions to having a sibling with special needs. And I'm using the term special needs because um, the SIG shop program is developed to assist siblings of any needs. So that could be developmental, it could be medical. It could be, um, I brought the program, I initially took the program, my training in the Mayo Clinic 
in Rochester, New York, and they were using it there for siblings of kids with or siblings of children with cancer. I brought the program back, and my background is a lot of working with families at risk and involved in this child welfare system. And I brought it back, and we actually did it in 2011 for um, foster for biological children in a foster home because they're growing up with siblings with complex needs as well. So. SIP shops uses the term special needs. I like to use the term complex needs, but um, common reactions to having a sibling with complex needs. We're going to look at the unique challenges of having a sibling with complex needs, um, unusual opportunities, and ways we can help. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about what SIP shops are for those who don't know about it. And then um, in between seven and eight, um, Grace is going to talk about her experiences having um, two brothers with autism, and then we'll have some time for questions. So as you can see, it's a bit of a lofty morning. I talk fast. Um, why we need to support siblings. The sibling relationship is typically the most enduring relationship an individual with special needs or complex needs will have. And this is something that I say over and over again, and everyone here in this room is nodding, but it often gets overlooked. I find particularly in certain systems, school systems being one of them, um, but it often gets overlooked, right? If life goes the way as we expect it to go, parents are typically the biggest care providers in the early years, but I, parents often pass away before their children do. So siblings take on that caregiving role. So they're the in the early years, they're also the most important role model for typically developing behavior. They're one of the most important role models for social skills modeling. So in the early years, they have a really important role. And in later years, they're often our longest relationship. And um, siblings of children with special needs face many of the same challenges that parents do. So as we talk through some of the challenges, many of these same par uh, challenges parents do, there's been a lot of research looking at this. And what we know is sibling parents are underserviced, but siblings are especially underserviced. So there's some common behaviors, roles, and reactions. Um, my background as a child and family therapist is, like I said, there's focus on disability-related issues within the family, but also a lot on attachment and behavioral patterns. So one of the things that after in the 10 years that I've been doing this program, almost 10 years, I've started to add my own pieces to it. And what we know is there's some certain behavioral patterns that exist. Some that Don Myers and the SIP shop people talk about, and some that my attachment background brings in. So we either see three types of reactions or quite often a combination of these three. So one is the caregiver role. So I call these kind of my compulsive for the attachment term will be compulsive caregivers, but the caregiving SIP. So these are children who take on a caregiving role to their siblings. This may or may not be signal dress for their parents. I work quite often with parents who don't signal this, but kids pick up on parents' needs and stresses within the family. Um, my background's in attachment, and I always say that attachment's about a strategy for survival, and kids are constantly watching their parents and what they need to do to keep themselves safe and survive. And many times, even though parents don't ask for this help, kids are highly attuned to what these parents need, and so they'll jump into the caregiving role. Um, and sometimes parents, particularly overburdened parents, will put or place the sibling into the caregiving role. Um, the parent may use them as a source of support, so it can be that emotional support or a second set of hands. Um, the second set of hands, so to speak, is when we don't have enough um, capacity to do what we need, we're asking the typically developing sibling to do things that maybe most other siblings wouldn't have to do. Um, the emotional support can take on a bit of a role of what we call spousified. And spousified is, it's particularly if the family, the adults don't have enough support themselves, they're the typically developing child becomes the emotional source of support. That as a therapist is one of the times that the second set of hands kids can deal with that can be stressful and we'll talk about how to help them with that. Becoming the emotional source of support, that's where we get more mental health issues and more stress, guilt and anxiety. This provides the children with, I talked about some of the negative things, but it also provides them with some real great opportunities, such as maturity, compassion, and leadership. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but it also may lead to guilt, undue stress, worry, anxiety, and inhibition. And I like to think that, you know, throughout life, we always have opportunities for challenges. There's always the chance for challenges or opportunities. So how do we maximize the opportunities of being a caregiver and minimize the challenges? So kind of connected to the caregiver is the super sibling. 
This is the child who feels the need to achieve. This is well documented um, in literature around sibling related issues. The sibling who is performance based. These for some siblings that focuses on academic, sport, artistic or social performance. Um, for some, it might be simply being the best behaved child. A lot of the kids that I've worked with, I should also say besides running chips, sim shops, I've done a lot of counseling with families and a lot of the kids I work with will talk about this that you know my parent doesn't have my family doesn't have enough space i'm summarizing what they would say but enough space for me to misbehave um, my my two brothers have enough kind of challenges of their own so i try to not cause any waves in the family and be as good as possible be as respectful as possible um and they don't want to like as it says cause all, um, undue stress onto over already overwhelmed parents Again, this may be directly placed on the child by parents. I've certainly worked with parents and children who have said in as many words, I need you to be the good one. Um, but often it's just a felt sense by the child. So this is something that the child feels and children kind of make their own shortcuts. Children have very limited understanding of the world around them. They have both great and limited understanding, and they will often make their own shortcuts, jump to their own conclusions, and bring things on themselves. This provides the child, again, with many opportunities for achievement pride, plus it also gives them extra attention from caregivers. When I did my first SIM panel in 2012, I think it was, with Grace at the Canadian Conference of Developmental Disabilities and Autism, I had five or six participants on the stage, nobody older than the age of 19. Every single one of the people in my, Grace was one of them, had amazing achievements. And it was quite interesting because at the end I said, tell us, tell me something you want to talk to about yourself or your siblings. Not one of them talked about themselves. I happen to know their achievements because I had worked with them in many contexts over the years. And these kids between the or young people between the ages of 15 and 19 all had national, international recognition around things that they had done. They were in the you know 99th percentile of the areas they chose, whether it be writing, whether it be cadets, whether it be soccer. Um, however, the super sip can also lead to guilt, undue stress, worry, anxiety, same things as the caregiving rule, but also a fear of disappointment and an inhibition of feelings. The tendency to want to hold those negative feelings in as not to stress out the parent. The super sip and the caregiver can go hand in hand. And then there's a whole other kind of reaction to having a sibling with special needs. And I like to term this one the resentful caregiver. And so when we run our SIP shops, one of the things we talk about is being respectful to everyone's experiences. So I would say my, my experience is a good proportion. If I have 12 kids in a SIP shop, probably eight to 10 are gonna fall more into the this role. And then a smaller portion are gonna be in that more resentful, I really hate this, this sucks, I don't like it. Um, this is the children who may, this child may feel angry, resentful, jealous, and avoidant of their sibling. Um, they may focus on what is unfair, the lack of attention or equity in the house. Um, the children do not understand equality versus equity. Okay. Um, children do not understand equality versus equity. They're very concrete in their thinking. They may have siblings who get a lot of attention, positive or negative, and feel left out. They may have siblings who are aggressive or embarrassing, which leads to resentment. And such children may act out their frustration. They might have attention seeking behaviors, behavioral issues, attentional issues, feign helplessness, so they might pretend they can't do things as a way to engage the parent more, um, aggression to siblings or to parents, and or avoidance of siblings. They may also get a message which contributes to the guilt that they shouldn't feel this way. Some of the opportunities that are drawn here is these siblings don't tend to inhibit as much, which is a positive thing. They tend to seek out support more and they tend to actually get flagged more within community programs because their behaviors, because they don't like this, they're saying they don't like it. I find that they get more supports in schools and programs, whereas sometimes the super sim gets reinforced for these amazing achievements, but the inhibition goes undetected. So those are kind of our three main patterns that we see. And then we're going to talk about the big three issues affecting most SIPs. These are the three most common issues that siblings will complain about or ways they miss out. So the first is the lack of attention. 
if you have a sibling with complex needs, whether they be medical, whether they be neurodevelopmental, whether they be behavioral, a lot of the attention goes to them. And we term these children the glass, their glass children or the glass child. I was gonna actually show a video, but we cut it because of the webinar of the glass child. I will send Jesse a link if I can find it on YouTube to the video. Um, and what the glass child means, it doesn't mean that the, the sibling, the typically developing sibling is fragile. What it means is that the parents often look through them to see the sibling on the other side. So they become kind of the invisible child. Um, this is well noted, well documented, and it's something that quite a few sibling programs will address with parents. Um, another way siblings may miss out or complaints of siblings is different treatment. And this goes throughout the lifespan. I talked about, I talked about um, younger kids being concrete, but what we know is throughout the lifespan at different points in their life, the differences in treatment will um, affect the siblings. So there's a, there's both perceived um, perceived and real unfairness and inequity. And um, so perceived inequity, a lot of my younger kids will talk about because they don't understand the difference between equality and equity. My mom spent an hour with this sibling versus the 10 minutes with me. And then there's just the realities of having a sibling with special needs or complex needs that requires a lot more care. And finally, the family functioning. Another complaint and way that siblings miss out is family functioning. Um, particularly the one that comes up for under 18 becomes the things we miss out on. So siblings of kids with special needs or complex needs often miss out on typically typical things. So they might not get to go to the same family dinners. They might not get to have their parents attend as many sporting outings. Um, years ago in sib shops, we one time had a sib shop because it's an open ended group. So you, some you come whenever you can. Then only three kids sh showed up and they were all teenagers, which was a bit rare because it's usually eight to 12. None of the activities we had planned were going to, I think there's only two teenagers, um, were going to fit because they were all active games. So I kind of went into my therapy office and I pulled out a bunch of board games. And one of the board games was Taboo. And one of the kids said, and I'll always remember this, oh, we have this game. I've always wanted to play it, but my brother hates the sound of the buzzer because it has that really annoying ring. She had a brother with autism. So it simply is missing out on playing a board game that all her friends had talked about. And I'll tell you, just playing board games for two hours. Uh, do you remember that? Yeah, I, I think you weren't there. Um, but it was really fulfilling for these kids. And then this one girl kept talking about, this is what my friends talk about. This is what my friends talk about. And of course, what we know about 13-year-olds is they identify, they're very peer oriented right? So her friends talked about this game that she really didn't have an opportunity to play. So we're going to now talk about some of the unique concerns. Um, these are, as, as said in the slide, directly taken from the SIBSHOP manual um, and the citations on the very front. Um, Dawn Myers has been, the man who created SIBSHOPs, has been researching and working with sibling issues since I think the late 70s. He is a sibling of somebody with um, a seizure disorder and epilepsy um, and has been invested in this. So <clears throat> these are some of the issues that he's detailed. So as we talk about, we're going to go through, um, I think, eight of them, eight or nine. Um, as we talk about them, I want to be clear, not every family is affected the same way. Everyone is unique. And there's other things that influence a sibling's um, experience of their brother and sister's difference, age. So one thing we know is older siblings tend to be more likely to, more, um, to struggle with caregiving roles, to struggle with individuation. Younger siblings are going to be more likely to struggle with over-identification and the lack of attention. Um, gender. Uh, the research would say that women tend to, female siblings tend to take on more of a caregiving role and have more guilt associated with this. Uh, type and severity of the disability. So that affects the child's um, concerns and their experiences with it. One of the things most commonly noted is how apparent the disability is um, or the difference is. So the more apparent it is, the easier it is for the sibling to manage and actually the less embarrassment that comes with it. There is some differences when there's feeding issues um, that can spike a little bit of embarrassment in adolescence, but actually the more invisible differences cause more embarrassment and stress for family members. I have a mom with a brain injury and 
this one always hits me because because her her difference is quite invisible. When I read this, and, and she's had a brain injury for most of my life, it, it helped me through, and we'll talk about that with embarrassment soon, and, and or not embarrassment, with uh, shame, it helped me recognize some of the pieces of shame came from wanting to protect and to say to the world, you know, hey, she experiences things differently, and, and what that looked like. Um, the responses of the family. Of course, different family responses are going to, some families are going to be more supportive, some families are going to give more supportive messages, Grace is going to talk a lot about her experiences. She, I'll skip to the end, um, had a very positive experience with her family. So the family responses there led to a very positive experience, which led to her being very close to her brothers. Services and supports available. The more supported a family is, the more supported the siblings are. Um, financial resources, so families with higher financial resources. Um, the siblings tend to care better. One of the reasons, one of the things that comes from that is more involvement in extracurricular activities. A lot of siblings with more, or families with more financial resources have siblings who really take on that super sib role and, and find these ways to um, excel at certain areas and get their needs met. Some of their needs met there. And then, of course, personal and cultural beliefs um, will affect how we perceive the difference, how we perceive the siblings' role, and what messages siblings have. We're going to talk about some of the common, um, unique, common concerns that are unique to having a sibling with complex needs. And so the first, and this tends to only affect younger siblings, more, more often affects younger siblings, is called over-identification. And that occurs when the sibling wonders whether they'll share their sibling's issue. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because I created part of this presentation years ago, but now most of my work is involved with child, uh, children and child welfare, or child family service agencies, and this still comes up. So when I have a one of my kids just the other day has a sibling with ADHD and ODD, so some pretty severe behavioral issues, and was saying to me, like, what if when I'm a teenager, I behave that way? Am I going to behave that way? And so it's that idea of whatever's happening with my sibling, will that affect me as well? It's associated with the severity of the illness, so it's more common with the milder the disability or the more invisible. Um, that's a direct quote from Gosman. Um, again, when when left to making our own, when left without information, children make shortcuts, and when there isn't many visible differences, more so behavioral or social emotional differences, children will over identify more often. Um, age, siblings who are older than their brother or sister um, are less likely to over identify. So how we can help. Each of these slides will talk about an issue and ways that we can help. And one of them is accurate information. I started to walk away. Um, one of them is accurate information. I said I cut out part of the slide or part of the presentation. One part that I usually talk about is information at different stages because it's really important. And if there's anything I can stress, you have to have and support families to have this conversation with siblings over and over and over throughout their life. You cannot just tell a sibling once your brother has autism, this is what autism is, and expect that that definition is going to, that understanding is going to be, is going to suffice for the rest of their life. Um, and at different stages, they're going to have different concerns and they're going to have different needs, informational needs. And providing accurate information at every step along the way is one of the most beneficial things a parent or a service provider can do to help increase that resiliency in the siblings. Embarrassment. I think this one is. For it's an obvious one, but it also becomes a very shameful and dirty little secret for a lot of the siblings I work with. It's one of the things we talk about most in sim shops. Siblings can be a source of embarrassment for many reasons. Unwanted attention, atypical behavior, feeding and changing issues become one of the higher embarrassed. Particularly, anyone guess what age embarrassment spikes? Teens. Do you know what teens? Did it say that on there? Oh, I said it there. So early adolescence. Early adolescents, those very insecure, peer-oriented, early adolescent children, 12 to 15, embarrassment is really high. And I don't know if you know, if you know anything about child development at that age, they're also very self-centered in their thinking. Um, so there's this need to figure out who I am, be self-centered, want to take care of themselves, want to individuate, and then want to fit in and be like everyone else. 
Um, the unwanted attention. This is something that I think I could get on my soapbox happens so often and and it's so interesting. I mean, there's unwanted attention that we can't protect kids from, right? Having a sibling with special needs is having a sibling with special needs. But there's unwanted attention that different service providers put on children without even realizing it. One of the number one things that comes up in sim shops, and it's come up time and time again, is how often schools or teachers or professionals within a school system will ask the typically developing sibling about their sibling's special needs or put them in a position of describing their special needs to other peers. I have some kids who participate in sim shops who love to do that. I had one little girl that was like her every year she had her little presentation around autism. She'd bring the books, all cats are autistic or all cats have Asperger's. You know, she had this whole way about going about it. She loved to teach about her sibling. I have other kids who feel really pressured, who feel like it is not my role, who don't know how to say no, who feel embarrassed, who feel very resentful. Um, so sometimes that unwanted attention isn't just the sibling's behavior, it's things that the adults around them place on this child, particularly around talking about or taking care of their siblings. Um, atypical behavior, aggression, um, public displays, and loud tend to be the ones that can be the most embarrassing. Um, again, the milder or the more invisible, the stronger the feeling of embarrassment may be. And embarrassment is greater at certain stages. So how can we help? Allowing space and acknowledging the embarrassment. Allowing space. I had one kiddo who, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I had one kiddo who um, at about 14 really struggled with walking with her brother and sister, her brother, in, in the mall because the behavior was really, really unpredictable. Um, it, it also resulted in her getting hit and hurt at times, right, because it was a stressful situation. And being 14, her peers hung out at the mall. Every time she was at the mall, she saw friends and things like that. So one of the things that her parents actually allowed her to do was have some space at the mall. And it took a while um, for her to be able to voice that. And because there was that sense of shame and guilt around being embarrassed that, you know, so they would have, they would eat together at the food court, they'd kind of split up to go shopping and come back and meet up. And acknowledging the embarrassment, really just validating the children's concerns and not having unrealistic expectations um, because it is challenging. And if we validate it, the kids are gonna have less experiences of shame, which we're gonna talk about more. Guilt. So much like embarrassment, um, guilt is a really common concern of children, um, of siblings of children with special needs, individuals, not just children. Um, this goes well into adulthood. They're far more likely to experience guilt than those do not, uh, than those with typically developing sibs. So there's many types and reasons for the guilt. The three main ones that we talk about are the survivor's guilt. So a lot of guilt over the over having abilities, health opportunities that their sibling may not have. This comes up quite often as children age. Um, this comes up really often around dating, around um, academic performance, around marriage, children, things like that, um, where a lot of guilt may be expressed that I have things that my sibling may or may not um, have the opportunity to have. Another form of guilt is typical sim conflict and ambivalence. I do a lot of family therapy. Kids, if you spend 30, 72 hours with anyone, they're going to get on your nerves. I say this to any, like, it doesn't matter who it is. You, you will laugh. You, you bring your best friend. You spend 72 straight hours with them. They're going to drive you nuts at some point. And siblings and any parent who has two, tip, two or more typically developing siblings, no, they fight, right? They fight. Um, and, and those siblings, Right. They learn how to resolve conflict. They learn how to develop sometimes a thicker skin. So my sister's 10 years younger, so there wasn't a lot of teasing, but my brother, my husband has a brother, has four brothers, and the way that they talk to each other sometimes is appalling, but um, he would say that I can't take a joke as easy as him. Um, and so one of the big things that we see in sim shops is expect normative behavior from normative sibs. And it's normal to feel frustrated, to feel annoyed, to say, leave me alone. What isn't normal is the experience of guilt afterwards. And so it's really common for kids to share stories of like my brother or sister, you know, did something that was really quite often destructive. That becomes a big one. And I think for those who were at 
Carrie and Aaron's presentation, they did a, a play, a skit around ripping up something. And this becomes, this is a real, some of the siblings with complex needs like to destroy things or it happens. And so, you know, you're working on building a Lego tower, your brother comes in and smashes it down and you get upset as any kid would, but then you feel this deep sense of guilt afterwards. That's the issue. How do we address that guilt? And guilt over um, parent caregiving. This comes up a lot as children age. It's a little less when they're younger, but part of it could be that parental life. So they start to see their parents being overstressed, overburdened, and be so focused on them and feel a sense of guilt around it. I should do more. This should come up a lot with these kiddos. I should do more. I could do more. Or leaving the parent to be a caregiver. So as children become adults and individuate, whether it be in adolescence, just starting to go out with their friends more, or actually moving out of the house, there's a lot of guilt around my parent having to do this and leaving, leaving my sibling behind. So again, how we can help validating and normalizing these concerns. This is something that when I work with parents in such shops, I say uh, to them, this is just something to bring up. Like, don't wait for your child to say, I feel guilty. This is something a parent or a service provider can encourage. To ask, do you feel a sense of guilt? How do you do this to bring to elicit some of what's happening underneath those, what I like to call those shameful, dirty little secrets that we don't want to talk about that sit and reside in the kids because those can be toxic. And here's where it gets toxic. Guilt. Guilt can lead to behavioral change and guilt isn't always such a bad thing, right? Guilt is, I don't like a behavior. I wish I didn't do that behavior. And, and often it can lead to behavioral change. It's not something you want to live in. Um, and embarrassment is just a normal part of growing, a normal part of being human, but particularly growing up. But when guilt and embarrassment intersect and they're not addressed, it often leads to shame. And this is concerning. This is the internet. It's it's um, guilt is a concern, but it can be manageable. Shame is much more deeply rooted. It's about the self. And it's linked to a variety of long-lasting and negative consequences. Guilt is, I don't like that I yelled at my brother. I shouldn't have done that. Shame is, I'm a bad person, I'm a mean person. It's, it's about, it's taking on a sense of that behavioral quality into themselves. Um, shame leads to anxiety, depression, like a, a whole variety of issues. Um, my mom, I said, has an invisible disability or invisible, she has a brain injury. And one of the things about her is she's impulsive. Um, she, she is. She's impulsive. She, she likes to make friends with anyone. I once came home. This is a true story. I once came home from Italy. I was traveling. I was studying for five weeks. I came home and somebody was living in her house that she had met at the bus stop that this person was homeless. And she had said, well, come on. And I said, well, we can't do that. So she's very friendly, likes to make friends with people, things like that. Um, but she's also quite impulsive and she takes things. She's a collector, she's a taker. And so wherever we go, I have to watch her sticky fingers because if she gets it in her head that she wants it, she will take it. And that behavior with a seven-year-old might be acceptable. That behavior with someone who has the appearance of differences might be acceptable. But when you're a 60-year-old woman who looks typically developing and you're walking around just, you know, stealing packs of holes from the store, it looks like you're just a thief, right? And so I can remember being 21 years old at the Forks um, and her stealing something and I didn't catch it. I had turned away. I got distracted. I was actually talking to a friend of a friend, so it wasn't even a close peer. It's actually my husband. Long story, but somebody and she got caught stealing. And the security guards came. These people that I barely knew witnessed it. It was one of the most humiliating moments of my life. It took me two years to be able to go back into a store with her. Because for me, the guilt and the shame, the guilt and the embarrassment. So then I felt this huge sense of embarrassment. I got very angry at her and then had this huge sense of guilt, right? And those two intersected for a long time. Um, and it took years. And so we both lost out on these opportunities. Um, how can we help address the guilt and embarrassment early on? So just normalize, validate, talk about how we do it. Um, in my case, you know, always travel with another person with my mom. So we always have a set of eyes on her. Um, that was one of the things that, you know, made it manageable. But you don't want to miss out on those opportunities. And I, I'm always going to be my mom's daughter. And most siblings are always going to be their brother or sister's caregiver. Or, I mean, um, brother or sister stay in their life. What we know is if we support siblings more and we reduce these, they're going to have better relationships and be better care providers later on. 
resentment. Siblings who resent are less likely to have an active and supportive role later on. So whatever we can do to mitigate resent, they may resent the parental attention. So common complaints are my sibling gets more time. They get more gifts. Oh my goodness, screen time, <laughs> screen time, screen time, screen time. So most parents, many parents, oh, yes, sorry, that's it. many parents limit their children's screen time and many children with complex needs either rely use or have a lot of screen devices. So this comes up, I only get a half hour on the iPad and my brother gets three hours, right? Um, or I've been wanting an iPod forever and my brother got a new iPad, right? Um, so time, gifts, and emotional support. My parents always lays with my brother or sister and puts them to bed. They never come and tuck me in at night. Um, they may resent unequal treatment. This comes up a lot again. Um, when the same behavior is not okay. So when my brother, I always use brothers, when my sister decides she doesn't want to do the dishes, my parents go and do it for her. But if I say I don't want to do the dishes, they say get your butt back in there and go do the dishes, right? So they have different expectations of me. And increased responsibilities. This kind of comes up with those, uh, or so expect to be the caregiver. A lot of siblings will complain about that. They'll complain about having to do more chores. And again, it's worse for females, uh, female siblings or older children. How we can help, one-on-one -on -one time. And I know, I know I'm not blind to the fact that if you have, if, you're, if your child's attending a sim shop, that means you have a minimum of two children, one with complex needs, your life is really busy. But how do you foster that one-to-one -one time? Now, what I like to say to parents, and we you know we're telling Carrie and Erin this when we were presenting together or when we were prepping this, um, my background is in attachment and reunification. I work with some really complex families and it just takes 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes of quality time with your child every day to, to reunify a family, to improve attachment. When I'm working with kids with really compromised attachment, it can take just 10 to 15 minutes of quality time. So most of the siblings I work with have good enough families, they just want more time. And sometimes as parents and caregivers, we think this time needs to be huge. We need to play board games. We need to do this. 10 to 15 minutes without, with no phones, put the phone away, put the screens away, be at the same level as your child and just engage with them. That one-to-one -one time doesn't, I mean, it's great. A lot of the parents I work with do things like have a, a night a month or a night a week with the sibling. Like, that's great. I really encourage that. But in the absence of that, just 10 to 15 minutes uninterrupted to the best of your ability um, with that typically developing sibling will go a long way. Different but equal responsibilities and make this really clear, especially for the younger, youngers and teens. Those young teens are really self-centered. The older teens are self-centered in their thinking. They're really egocentric. The older teens are just wanting to kind of do their own thing and push and challenge. And the younger kids are very concrete in their thinking. So they don't always understand, as I said, the difference between equity and equality. So they don't understand that I have to do the dishes and my brother or sister just has to carry them over. That seems like a two minute chore compared to a 10 minute chore. So however concrete we can make this, a lot of my families will use things like reward charts or chore charts specifically so that it's made visual that child A and child B both have their own responsibilities, even though they might look different. Um, and reducing expectations. So recognizing if there's resentment developing, how can I reduce these expectations? Are my expectations too high? Do And, and because these SIBs often are like that super SIB, um, they are really overachievers. We sometimes forget how young they are and they can miss cue us about their age because they're very socially adept. They're very smart, they're all of those things. But maybe looking at do the expectations need to, are they realistic? Pressure to achieve. Long documented by researchers, this group, as I've said, is a high achieving bunch. Some suggest that this is due to the need to make up for the siblings' limitations. Um, some research suggests the pressure comes from parents. Some suggest it comes from typically developing siblings themselves. There's some discrepancy in that. So, and many sibs know they felt such a pressure, others strongly disagree. This is a really contentious issue. So some sibs will say, yes, I did, and others are like, no, I didn't, and they don't like that that's kind of the perception out there. What we do know is it's a high achieving bunch. What we also know is that when you have a sibling with complex needs, it, well, we'll talk about that in a sec, but it, 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 it 
correlates to career choices? Anyone have an idea of what career choices that might be? Pardon me? Healthcare, the helping professions, teaching, social work, like all of us, basically this whole room, <laughs> like healthcare, teachers, social workers, healthcare professionals, nurses are the big four. Uh, when I said social workers, I meant more social services, but uh, the big four. So how we can help, again, try not to focus too much on achievements. And this is a hard thing to do because a lot of these sibs, that's where they shine. That's where they have, that's, that's their place to be special um is you know being the best soccer player but one of the things i work a lot with families on is you know validating and working with like that's great like you want to reward these accomplishments but don't focus so much on the accomplishments because if we spend a lot of time focusing on the accomplishments those who take shortcuts those young kids who take shortcuts sometimes correlate that with by accomplishing things my parent is more proud of me and really we want to get the message i'm proud of you just for being you normalize and validate isolation and loneliness so this comes up a lot. This is a huge issue for many siblings, children, and adult ones. And so the initial, there's the, there's the isolation and the loneliness from parental attention. So they often become lost in the shuffle. They become that glass child that we talked about. So there might be some isolation within the family unit. There's isolation from peers. I wish I could have shown the glass child video because she talks a lot about that, the little girl. In it. Um, they're often unable to find many siblings are unable to find peers with shared experiences. Um, sometimes we have siblings who are picked on, bullied, or made fun of. Um, and, and even for those who aren't, which is thankfully becoming less and less, and even in the six years I've been doing this, um, they're often unable to talk about their experiences with SIBs. Many have difficulty discussing with peers who do not have the same experience. So they, they tend to give very superficial answers. They can't talk about guilt and resentment and embarrassment because that feels more shameful. Um, and then there's an isolation from the process, information in the process. The way that many service providers work, um, many services work, they lead, this is a quote directly from Don Myers, they lead siblings in a literal and figurative way. So they're isolated sometimes within their homes. They're often isolated to some degree from their peers or different from their peers. And then there's all of this stuff going on with their sibling that many kids are unaware of, they're unsure of, they don't know what it is. When I started Sip Shops, now this again is getting better. When I started Sip Shops in 2011, we ran a camp and we had a different professional come in each day and we had no tea. Oh, my old executive director was no tea. And she came and spoke and we had 14 kids and only one had met no tea before. And all of them had siblings with neurodevelopmental issues. Um, and so they're like, oh, that's what you do. Um, they heard about this, you know, magical woman with this bag and, and of, of sensory things, right? Um, and parents do not provide info because of a desire to protect the child from stress or sadness. So service providers sometimes leave them out. And a lot of, and again, this is getting, this has changed just in the six years, seven years I've been doing this. Um, I've had many parents. I've, I've had parents, family members participate in sim shops. They brought their kids to sim shops and we talk about our sibling special needs. We talk about what it is, you know, does it have a name, like those kind of things. And I've had parents say, well, we, we, we don't provide a name for it. You know, the brother has autism, but we don't use that term. So the kid's like, well, something's different, but I don't really know. And I understand the desire not to label, but it leaves the child really confused. And this is just coming from a place of protecting the child. Or when there's really complex health issues going on with the child, maybe the parent wants to protect and not stress them out. But little people have big ears. That's my grandma saying. Bless her heart, she used to say that my whole life. Little people have big ears. And as a child therapist, I will tell you, they hear everything. Like, so many kids can come into my office and tell me, how much child support one parent owes the other? Like they hear it, and because they know they're they're constantly that goes into that attachment. I rely on you to stay safe, so I gotta track what's going on with you as my caregiver. So if something's going on with my sib and you're stressed over it, I'm gonna feel it, and we gotta find an age appropriate way to talk about it. Um, we can help again one on one attention, provide opportunities for peer support, big time. That's one of the reasons I brought sib shops back to Manitoba to start to provide those opportunities normalize needs for peer support and model this. So what we, what I can tell you, and being worked in Sip Shops for seven years, is the parents who are the most involved themselves 
tend to involve their children the most. So parents who have a really good support system, who are used to talking about this, who have all of that, have children who they find ways to support and involving them in the process. So my background's in play therapy. I know I talked about that, so I do play therapy. And so I have this really neat office. If you ever come to, I have a couple offices, but my particularly my Winnipeg office, it's filled with toys, it's got a sand tray, it's got cushion. I mean, it is a really cool place to be. Now, what siblings don't realize is that the kids coming to me are coming from really complex trauma places. They're coming for treatment of complex trauma, always. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, change in households, really heavy issues. And I would watch these kids come up, so I'd go up with little Johnny up to my office, and then his little brother would be waiting there. And all his little brother knew is that he doesn't know about the trauma, nor he shouldn't at five years old or 10, you know. But all he knows is Johnny gets this attention from this nice lady um, and gets to go to this super cool office with all of these toys and come down with all this artwork and say, I played this game. And so one of the things that I can do, I, I mean, I, I know I, I have a program in practice, so I get to kind of do what I want. <laughs> I incorporate Sims into that process. So quite often at the very end of my session, I give them 10 minutes to play, just free play if I have time, and I then do use that time to debrief with the parents so that the sibling gets this experience. The other sibling gets to just play in my office in a non-trauma, like just a normative way, and, and that gives me time with the parents, but it's just bringing them in. Because just like an OT, I think this quite often with the OT, I know, we all know the work that's happening, but to the typically developing sim, it looks like some really cool games and toys and activities. They don't understand what's happening there. So I'm going to just very briefly talk about the unique opportunities and then um, Grace is going to talk about the work when it's fine. Um, so some unusual opportunities, because I don't want to just end with the bad stuff, right? I mean, there's a lot of challenges that come, but there's a lot of really great things that come with having a sibling or a family member with special needs. One is maturity. These kids are about the most mature you'll meet. They are well-spoken, they're mature, they're intelligent. Many of the kids I work with in sim shops are confident and wise beyond their years. And this lasts well into their adulthood. Um, I find that as, as adolescents, they're less self-centered, they're more compassionate, um, and they're more connected quite often. If they're supported within the family, the siblings, my adolescent siblings, are more family-oriented quite often than those without uh, siblings with differences. Um, insight and life perspective. They have a different insight and life perspective that comes with having all of these opportunities. Tolerance and empathy, again, I work with kids. I've been doing it for 15 years. These are probably the most empathic, tolerant children. They are um, they are caregivers and not in the way of caregiving their sibling, caregivers in that they want fair treatment, equal treatment, and will stand up for what they believe in. They have an increased appreciation for family, health, capabilities. They really appreciate what they have. What, they, what their health and their family, and they have a huge accomplishment for their pride and their sibs accomplishments. These, most of the sibs I work with, will can brag and talk about their sibs for hours on end. And I work with a lot of kids. And in typically developing families, it's pretty rare for Johnny to come in and be like, my brother plays football, and tell me all about it. They don't really care. Um, but um, when one of the kids learns to walk, learns a new word, we hear a lot more. Um, loyalty. There's a sense of loyalty, it's particularly in friendships with these kids, not just with their family, but they have a stronger sense of friendship and what loyalty is. Advocacy, they make some of the best advocates. I mean, the Sibling Support Network and all of the books and things that I've read tend to be written. Not many people go into this field unless you've had a family member with um, some, uh, differences. And of course, the vocational opportunities we talked about. So the ways we can help, parent education and support, um, and parent education and support around sibling issues, not just around, I mean, parent education and support for the sibling um, with complex needs, but around these issues. Uh, specifically, the big one I would say in there is accurate and developmentally appropriate information, helping parents understand what that is and what that looks like. Um, peer support opportunities for both independence and dependence. So we need to encourage these kids to have a life outside of the family, because sometimes they can be too enmeshed, but we also have to give them that dependence within the family. It's okay to come and cry and hug and cuddle with parents and say, I need you. This should be about me um, in this moment. Um, opportunities to be involved in the process, meetings, planning, doctor's appointments, one-to-one -one time with caregivers, and a big one, because 
you can't do this alone, is including extended family. If possible, if this is um, a big piece, we need to include that extended family for not just the parents, but for the siblings, right? So make it known that, you know, I may, maybe I can't give this kid as much one-on-one -on -one time as they need, but how can, is there an uncle, is there an aunt, is there a grandparent, how can we make sure that? Um, Last little slide was just about, thank you very much, um, was just about the SIP Shop program. It's an international program, works with the brothers and sisters of kids with special needs, 8 to 12, but it can be adapted for older or younger groups. We just like to keep that chunk together. Um, and it brings SIPs together in the two universal languages, play and shared experience. And the last thing I would say is that SIP Shops, 60% have nothing to do with your sibling with special needs. Um, I, ran into some issues in the past with other agencies, historically places trying to run SIP things. And one of them said, we had SIPs talking for two hours about their siblings and they didn't really want to come back. And I was like, that sounds kind of boring. Um, I'm a play therapist. And so a big part of this is how we incorporate it. So if you're going to get, I mean, you, this, what I see, and I say this very clearly, parents, 60% has nothing to do with their siblings. And some parents don't like that. And that's fair. I understand it. But I want them to know this is not just about talking about their SIPs. It's about celebrating themselves, getting to know themselves and processing what's going on with them. So 40% um, is very directly related to their SIPs. About 20% is just having fun and playing. And then about 30-40% um, 30, 30, is related to themselves and understanding themselves. Any questions? I know we're really behind. I guess that's how you make sure you have no questions. You just move on to the very end and then I don't have to be put on the spot. Um, so thank you so much, Julie and Grace, for the great presentation. So hopefully after this, um, everybody can think about how in your own practice today and the rest of the week, um, and the rest of the year actually, um, how you can include siblings and talk with families and siblings about what they want and what they can do. Um, so before everyone runs off, if you could please fill out the feedback survey um, in front of you. There's some pens around so you have to share them. And then if everyone can make sure that they sign in before they leave. And then in January, January 8th, so just after the um, holidays, we'll be hearing um, about child and adolescent mental health um, services in Manitoba. Please. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah, That's okay. Are you sure? Actually, the friend that I'm buying the necklace for is